uh, I personally still think he managed to open up a whole new area of, of thinking, you know, when it comes to the Anunnaki or the Anunnagi, as uh, Christian calls them, and uh, their level of, of knowledge and sophistication. Um, but, you know, just as Sitchin, Christian O'Brien have, um, you know, had his level of criticism as well. But would, would you compare Christian O'Brien and, and Zachariah Sitchin in any way? What do you think, uh, Edmund, would be the differences and, and the similarities, if any, between them? I think that um, um, Zachariah Sitchin uh, brought uh, the attention of, he called them the Aranuki, um, and he is incredibly thorough in terms of the ground he covered on the whole idea that we are the products of an advanced civilization. Uh, he made the point that um, he thought that advanced civilization had somehow come from Nibiru or the sky or spacemen or whatever, or so did von Daniken. Mm. But what we must do is not get bogged down in the negative. Um, th there are certain things which are now clear, which may not have been clear to Zechariah Sitchin when he started out. I don't believe he had an intent to defraud or to misrepresent the truth. He tried to put the whole story together as a colorful story. And as Michael Heiser said, he was very much based as a journalist primarily. Mm. Um, as most successful authors are, I've known some incredible researchers and people who have incredible knowledge who've written books but haven't sold one copy because they didn't do what Zachariah Sitchin did. Right. So how do you get knowledge out there? How do you get across to people? And Zachariah Sitchin was feeding, if you like, what people wanted to hear, what they wanted to know um, in terms of this concept of an advanced civilization and that there was much more going on in our human past than anybody realizes. The uh, areas where I think I agree quite a lot of, with what Michael Heiser says, but I think that my own um, strong uh, evidence I obtained from L.A. Waddle, and L.A. Waddle was the man who uh, was the great linguist. Um, he was a lieutenant colonel in the British Army. Mm. He was a great scholar. He was enormously respected by all the key people in the past, Sace, um, uh, Hyatt and Ruth Verrill, um, many other people. I've been reading um, a very interesting document called The Amazing History of Race. And a lot of material there which is takes the Bible as a history book um, mm. and, uh, and cross-references the most amazing detail about how we have this diffusion of peoples uh, from the land of Canaan. And then we find that the Canaan or Canaan started off as K-H-A and then Ann on the end. So it might have been something that sounded a bit like Carsag, um, the land of Carsag or the land of Ann. And then we get the people of Tuafadanan and then we get Manu in India. So we've got some really interesting things here coming out. But what Waddle did, which I believe is immensely important, is that he was able to look at the, the Indo-Sumerian seals. And these were the very earliest writing, or some of the earliest writing in the Indus Valley and in the Sumerian um, languages, the archaic languages, the Hittites. Um, and he looked at the British Eddas and the Vedas, and he began to realize when he looked at the detailed translations, he was talking about one great Indo-European civilization. Yeah. So we mustn't box the Vedas and the Indus Valley as a different civilization to the Sumerians because it wasn't different. And we mustn't think the Sumerians were the earlier civilization because they weren't. The earlier civilization was clearly three or four thousand years before within the land of Canaan. And Waddle's, uh, one of the key points about Waddle where I believe it reveals uh, the importance of dates is the so-called Isin uh, chronology. And Waddle, uh, in, I've got it on my website on the goldenageproject.org.uk. I've got two documents in that chronology which deal with the, the Isin dates, which claim that the Sumerian kings went back to 250,000 BC. 
And this was clearly nonsense. It was one man who got the thing badly wrong. In fact, he was a Cambridge scholar. That may be why people listened to him. I don't know. <laughs> right. But the point was, it was, got, it was very wrong. And what Waddle did brilliantly, and that's also on my website, and I hope it's clear, Waddle realized that if he cross-referenced the data and the language, and he understood what was going on. And anybody who reads the feet of the Indo-Sumerian seals deciphered by L.A. Waddle will see that Waddle produced an accurate dates for the Sumerian kings and that the first Sumerian king was somebody called Thor or Uraeus hmm. at round about 3,370 B.C. So the Sumerians were, were if you like, were a, a um, group of kings who formed um, an empire, we call it an empire, but it was a confederation of city-states at about 3,370. Um, and this was this great, if you like, um, increase in population and m migrations around the world. Um, and the colonization of the world. We find the Sumerians in Peru, in North America. We find them just about everywhere where you can take a ship. And we know that they had, and Sitchin highlights these points, which you got from Samuel Noah Kramer of, I think it was something like 60 different names for different aspects of sailing and ships. And then we find ocean-going ships um, in the archaeology of um, southern, the southern area of what is now Iran in the Persian Gulf and bitumen being used to sea or timbers. And it's clear that there were ocean-going ships very much earlier than people accept today yeah, yeah. and that the Sumerians had colonized, literally colonized the world. And even the Cambridge Dictionary talks about the four quarters, which is a word often used by the Sumerians as being the whole world. So I've skated around a lot of issues, but I think it's really important for people to realize that Sitchin and other people claiming that the Sumerians go back 220,000 years just is not making any sense at all. We actually have got to look at all the new excavations, um, Tel Zidon, um, Ketelhoek, uh, the new discoveries in the Jordan Valley, which are giving us city-states which compare with Uruk at the same dates. Mm. And so as we peel back the layer of archaeology and look at the um, tells or occupation mounds um, of the stable city-states where you had maybe three or four thousand years of history on one of those mounds, a good example being Tel Nebi Mend, which is called Kadesh now, and Tol Nebi Men was the place that Kathleen Kenyon's team wanted to go to next and did go to. And Peter Parr was in charge of the excavations. And they only did a small amount of the work needed, but at least they got down to really serious activity, um, human activity, at about 8,000 BC. Um, and so we've, we've got much earlier dates. The new dating methods are pushing dates back. We're seeing, in fact, we have city-states springing up uh, all over the place in that um, eastern uh, Mediterranean region, yeah. um, much earlier than the Sumerian civilization. And I think that's immensely important, and that is where we're going at the moment and where we have to look at the big picture. Yeah, yeah there's new finds uh, coming to the surface all the time in that sense. And, uh, you know, again, uh, Sitchin will be, you know, missed, obviously. He uh, he had a lot of interesting contributions to make. And, and again, I think he opened up this area to a wider audience, as it were, you know, kind of Fondanik in style, obviously, as well, in that sense. And obviously, interpretations and things can and always should be, you know, argued. Uh, but in many cases, some of these, uh, you know, thinkers are, they're spearheading the way a little bit as well for other people to get in there and, and re-examine some of the material that they interpret and, and manage to dig out from these records as well. Um, and I guess when we're kind of on this topic of, of you know, researchers that have been uh, passing from this realm, um, I, why don't we just spend a little, little bit of time and talk about uh, your friend, I guess, and, and a colleague as well, Lawrence Gardner. He also, you know, passed away here not too long ago, and, and he touched upon many of these areas as, uh, as well. Uh, some of these areas were, were dovetailing in terms of uh, trying to find the 
the origin for for human civilization and and how far back into history we we can go in terms of archaeology and obviously also looking at uh, religious and and other kinds of scriptures from the ancient world. Um, and I know that you kind of collaborated a little bit with him on his uh, book that is that is upcoming, one that he wrote called Origin uh, of of God. Tell us a little bit about that, uh, Edmund. Well, Lawrence Gardner and Zechariah Sitchin are and will be, I think, two of the most famous figures in terms of people who have opened up the door to our ancient human history and the great sophistication of the past and the failings of civilization to pass knowledge from father to son. Sitchin was not a man who produced references. Uh, he was much more of a journal journalist, but he he demonstrated um, and found all sorts of things which related to an advanced civilization. Um, in my opinion, Lawrence Gardner's work was as well referenced as any other researcher I've ever known. In other words, his reference were very, very good and valuable. And I spend a lot of time looking at people's references and looking at individuals because you can get a very good idea of whether somebody's telling the truth or anybody's competent if you work with them and see how they work and what kind of people they are. Um, and I'll add just a word on Christian O'Brien. I'm com we're coming to that a little later. But mm -hmm. Christian O'Brien, we've got a, um, a wonderful uh, book of his letters to his mother called Eastern Odyssey. And as a young man from Cambridge and the first years of his working life, he goes and writes to his mother and gives her a fantastic detail of what he's doing and how he's doing it. And those letters reveal extraordinarily disciplined, competent human being and the love he had for his mother. Um, a wonderful basic start in looking at um, somebody who is going to get results, who's going to do the job. And I'm sure Sitchin did that in his own way. And then Lawrence Gardner, as I say, totally different approach to Sitchin. Um, no less important, I think very much more important. Um, but he was telling people what they didn't want to hear. Um, and I found, I actually received a lot of flack for even associating with him, which I found interesting. Uh, I found all the people who were criticizing Lawrence were people who were doing a character assassination without providing one scrap of evidence themselves as to what was wrong with his research. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, my own view was that I believed that he did cover an awful lot of ground, um, as did Sitchin. And I think that a lot of that ground... Uh, some of it can be criticized, but if we're going to go anywhere, we've got to look at the things we can agree uh, about. And I've often said to people, look, you really don't like what I say, but there are 29 out of 30 things that we can agree on. Let's concentrate on the positive side of this equation yeah. and see what we can develop in terms of further knowledge on the things we agree about and not spend and waste time on things that Bickering, um, fighting. upset either of us either way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that's <laughs> and true. that's really that's really a key point. And so yeah. I um, in my in my work with Lawrence Gardner found that he would listen to my point of view. I could argue things with him or discuss things with him and we had a very constructive relationship. And uh, even with the uh, origin of God, uh, there was some doubt in his mind as to what the Sumerians were actually doing. Mm. And my view was that the genetic modification of the crops and, 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 and people definitely took place at the early, the first Karsag, Karsag, the first Eden. And I think that knowledge probably, a technology had disappeared by the time we get to Sumer. But I may be wrong, and, and it's an open question. We need more proof, more evidence of that. Yeah. And what we see amongst the Sumerian records, particularly the archaic, very early records, is the remains, very clear remains, of a very advanced civilization. And I'll just mention one key point about Lawrence Gardner. He was criticized for the white powder gold technology. Um, yet, I've got the letters that Professor Hapgood, another wonderful man who um, was responsible for maps of the ancient sea kings, supporting the whole concept, of an advanced civilization. Mm. And these letters between Hapgood and the head of the Atomic Energy Commission at Harwell in the 50s 
Um, they're on uh, one of my lectures, which is the proof of an advanced civilization. And the Harwell, the boss at Harwell, was absolutely clear that the people who lived in the land of Canaan at uh, four, five, maybe six thousand BC knew how to produce pure gold. The only way you produce pure gold without any impurities is heat it to between 5,000 and 6,000 degrees. And he was well aware of that uh, archaeological information from metallurgy, uh, which supported the powdered metal technology and the incredible skills by the goldsmiths in those ancient times. Mm. And the, one of the another great historians called Charles Roland, who was head of the University of Paris, has an extraordinary story there in, him, in, in himself. He was shunned by the, his establishment and had to leave in disgrace. But he had everything wrapped up in his four volumes of ancient history and, and made the point that the closer we get to the land of Noah, as he called it, which we, we, we mistakenly believed is the land of Canaan from the way the Bible is written, etc. But the closer we become to the land of Canaan, the more we find um, the, the, the perfection in the arts and sciences. Hmm. So when we actually begin to look at um, what's going on here, we find that there are many other people, including Plato, Charles Rollin, uh, W.J. Perry, um, and on and on and on, who were all saying and confirming what Sitchin was saying later and Lance Gardner was saying later. Yeah. So we have a fantastic story to uncover, and all we can do, all of us, and you at Red Eyes have done a fantastic job in helping seekers of the truth to get the truth out to the people. The people need to know about their history. They've been lied to in the past. Mm. They're lied to now. Um, we want to be able to have a much clearer view of what it's all about. We want to be able to realize that there was a golden age, that social organization can be run extremely efficiently um, and that we need as many good people as we can. Mm. <laughs> Back to this concept to Plato saying that good people don't need laws, bad people will break them anyway. <laughs> so true. we, we need true. to be able to think much more about how we can all network and work together positively. Um, and that's what I hope is ha going to happen. Uh, you're leading that with this subject. Um, uh, Laird Scranton's done fantastic work which supports um, this concept of an advanced civilization, um, the many other people. And if we all work together and, and exchange ideas, I believe that we can really um, get a marvelous message out to right. everybody who's interested about the past so we really can learn from past knowledge. And Lawrence Zachariah Sitchin, all the great names, W.J. Perry, Charles Rollin, Plato, everybody's contributed and we just need to be open-minded and, and trust a little bit more in, in our history books um, or some of those people who have um, said controversial things. And mm. maybe L.A. Waddle is one of the great stars in being able to really pinpoint many important things um, which should have been taken on board by the archaeological establishment. But the archaeological establishment are not linguists. Um, they're yeah. not um, people who can get involved in geology, astronomy, um, and maybe 20 other professional exactly. skills which are required yeah. to really do their job properly. So right. let's not think that archaeologists are going to solve problems. They're not. They're making a contribution. Let's get everybody who can make contributions to work together, and then we can sort these problems out. That's right. More holistic thinkers in one way, and, and again, those who can, uh, you know, coalesce or, or look at many different uh, topics and, and areas of uh, anthropology, uh, you know, as you mentioned, archaeoastronomy, and, and all these different fields that are adding to the picture, obviously. And, and again, we... We still obviously need the archaeologists, excuse me, to do the groundwork, the legwork, to 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 dig into the earth and do things like that as well. And but definitely things are very much compartmentalized. And and one, you know, I can't help to wonder now and then if there's any people, you know, if you will, on on the on the top of that universal a university kind of structure, if you will, 
of the hierarchy that actually are uh, collecting some of the data and, and, and building a, a, a different picture themselves. So obviously, we are aware that people uh, like us who come from the alternative circles, if you will, are doing that as well. But uh, I mean, do, do, do you think that other people are, are aware of this image as well, or, or they have an idea that things are probably not as the mainstream are, are putting it? Uh, and these could be the people who are, in some cases, funding these kinds of programs or, or are associated with them in, in any other way. What do you think, uh, Edmund? Well, I, got, I can mention two individual people, one I shall name because she's been on your programs, Antoine Jugal. Mm. And Antoine's done fantastic work. And I just had a, a document which was uh, been translated for me regarding um, Osiris being Anne and much earlier activity in Egypt, which ties in with O'Brien, who makes the point that the first settlement in Egypt was at On, which can be also called An, or Heliopolis, in the Nile Delta, and that must date back to something like um, 9,000 BC, 8,500 BC as a starting point in Egypt. It's actually precisely on the 30, uh, 30 degree Sorry, 30, yes, 30 degree latitude, which mm. have been, somebody's pointed out, Peter Watts has pointed out, one of the great mathematicians who's doing fantastic work on understanding uh, the mathematics of the past and how clever our ancestors were. But Antoine Jugal um, has done super work on Egypt and the pyramids, makes the point that there's so much more under the pyramids. I know Robert Temple has done fantastic work, another great researcher. Um, mm. you know, are the burials underneath the, um, the, the great buildings beneath the pyramids, the Valley Temple and the Sphinx Temple, or are they part of the great waterworks which would have provided water for people who took cover <laughs> from cometary debris? There's right. still a lot of questions to be asked. But yeah. Antoine Jugal um, makes the point that the difficulty with archaeologists is that they're only able to book a short time to do their archaeological work when they go to Egypt. And most of the time they're teaching in universities um, and then they go out and do the excavations. Um, and then sometimes they only have as little as two weeks to do their work and they spend the first week clearing the sand out of what they dug out last year. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, and so, you know, putting your, digging holes and looking at things in the slow and painstaking way that the archaeologists do it is a very, very slow process, and, yeah. they, and they shouldn't claim that they know all the answers without looking at all the other clues. The other point I want to mention, I'm not going to mention any names, because professionally people are still worried about losing their jobs and not being respected if they make um, outrageous claims. Mm. But um, I know that the botanists around the world, all those people who specialize in early plants, particularly tropical plants, they found out that hybridization is, is a, an interesting process which uh, requires human intervention. And they found that the only place, places where you find hybridization of plants around the planet is where there were human occupations in the past. Now, they have looked at the plants, looked at what was produced, uh, what the two plants were before the hybridization took place, and they can do all the genetic studies and work. They still cannot get those hybridized plants to seed and produce seed. And in other words, they will tell you quietly behind the scenes that there must have been a very sophisticated people around hybridization plants because we haven't yet with modern science caught up with them in terms of hybridization and seed production on many of these particular uh, very interesting plants that mm. are found where there's human occupation. Yeah. And the words given to me were somebody's eventually going to push the button and we can all um, tell the world about this but for the moment we mustn't say anything because we're going against the established view. And this is the same for me. I've, I've been um, in politics and advisor to politicians and political parties, and I've made comments about um, the, the uh, various 
um, things, for example, the subject of the Garden of Eden, the subject of ancient laws dealing with the management of wildlife and the various parts of Genesis are absolutely clear that we should manage the planet, we should deploy man's benevolent guiding hand in the good management of the planet mm. and we shouldn't be protecting things, we should be managing them and that we really can make an, a tremendous difference by getting involved in good management and this is what we can learn most of all from the Garden of Eden site and what was going on. Mm. But when we start, when I start talking about uh, the Bible or Genesis uh, texts and I talk about the reality of the Garden of Eden, um, everybody switches off and thinks I'm completely nuts. Well, I'm not too bothered about that because I shall be around a long while yet. I shall keep banging on about it and that's why I'm here. <laughs> right, right. Well, that's, that's... Those two points are very important mm. and so there were two people, Antoine Chigal's fantastic work, look at her website, um, she's terrific, um, independent, speaks Arabic, gets behind the scenes, really knows what's going on in Egypt, go on her journeys to Egypt and uh, just one little thing she she said at one of her lectures which I thought was important was that the absolutely fantastic uh, 140 foot long boat which was found in kit form beside the Great Pyramid yeah. um, she said that the dating of that was a thousand years earlier than the Great Pyramid and so that incredible technology of a demountable boat um, where some experts have said it was in the same degree of, of uh, sophistication as the tea clippers in the 1850s in terms of technology. And that boat was a thousand years earlier than the Great Pyramid. And that there wasn't just one boat, there were loads of boats and, and some of the pyramids had two, some had four. Uh, Abu Rawash had a boat pit. So boat pit boats were a very important part in that whole program of building a hundred pyramids and I've dealt with this in my earlier talks that they weren't for dead people they were to keep as many people alive as possible supplied with water and the boats were there in case the catastrophe was of the same magnitude as the one in 10,900 hmm. so and more and more there were excavations at Hierankopolis last year which are throwing up um, cedar trees from Lebanon uh, in that um, Nile Valley going back nearly to 4000 BC. And so all the time the dates are going back, we're finding yeah. out more. And this is where the Egyptian authorities have got to stop being childish and open up all those areas which need to be properly explored by not only archaeologists but other scientists, other independent researchers who want to see what's going on. We shouldn't be hiding um, very important archaeological information from people who want to know. That is totally dishonest, in my opinion. Mm. And the sooner that can be stopped, the better. So, you know, as you mentioned, there are there many, you know, linguists in some sense have have an ability to unlock uh, mysteries from the ancient world. But basically, you're giving a kind of a heads up, if you will, then that uh, botanists might be, you know, another area of expertise where more information. Uh, might be coming from them uh, if if they're allowed to follow through on their work, and and I reckon that at this you know day and age, that's kind of uh, where things are heading as well. So many people, in terms of you know genetic engineering, are looking at seeds and 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 plants and try to find the the origin of that. They're trying to find genetic diversity, and and even now some of the diseases that are starting to hit uh, the wheat, you know, the the stem rust and other things as well. There's weird uh, plant diseases out there as well. Uh, many people are, are you know, uh, focusing their eyes, if you will, on uh, on on the seeds and the and the our food production, if you will, in that sense. So we we might learn a lot from that in in the coming uh, years, hopefully. Yeah, that's really exciting, isn't it? When you think that um, the gen gen human genome and the plant genome and 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 what we're now learning about the climate, uh, one thing, uh, the climate change. Uh, excitement has created is an awful lot of information about what the planet's been doing over the last 50,000 years and all the technology uh, in looking at temperature change and uh, um, CO2 um, temperature, uh, looking at ice cores. There's a tremendous amount of information is being fed into the pot, so to speak, 
so that we can uh, um, see quite clearly that agriculture at 9400 BC when we have the first records it's now generally accepted that agriculture whole range of domesticated crops and animals arrived at 9400 BC which mm. coincided with the end of the great younger Dryas ice age all of a sudden the planet warmed up very quickly and we eventually find within 2000 years uh, these a whole range of crops all around the world and uh, yeah. the idea that um, and the old fashioned idea that it was independent sites it now becomes perfectly clear that the stories of culture bearers taking uh, civilization and agriculture around the world now make sense and so the archangels, the angels and the watchers, the culture bearers and took the seeds, took the knowledge and in a very short space of time had traveled around the world and given us our history if you like mm. and so that's another, another clue. So almost every month we're getting more wonderful supporting evidence to say that um, there was an advanced civilization, there was a benevolent um, group of people, small group of survivors from global catastrophe um, and they provided um, so much and that was very clearly understood by ancient peoples in the city of Uruk and Ur and Abraham um, and the great cities were named after these gods or dedicated to them um, the Assyrians knew exactly who their gods were um, and had them up around the walls of their throne room and you can still see them in the British Museum today all the individuals mm. and um, Hadrian who was remember Hadrian was the Roman Emperor who was running the show at the right at the peak of the Roman Empire when everything went really well and he actually uh, nominated I think three successors after he died because he knew he had to pick the right men for the man for the job mm. and so Hadrian himself was an, a very very significant and key figure strong leader good leader good man and he built the Pantheon in Rome um, to honor the original nine gods of Karsag <laughs> and that building still stands today it's still the most remarkable and most beautiful building stands today so mm. nothing's new under the sun to the wise man and we have that history there it, and um, it's very clear that we've got ourselves in such a silly muddle um, really um, erasing from the minds of the people that knowledge of their ancestors and their past which took place at about from 500 BC and a thousand years later uh, 500 AD we found that um, the world was flat and stopped teaching the fact that the world was round <laughs> um, and uh, we were all sinful and so um, you're all sinful but uh, don't worry just come and pay us some money and we'll forgive your sins and everything will be okay. Yeah. And the concept of free will, which is mm. desperately needed today, equality of women, um, the whole concept of social organization was completely changed while the overlordship of land and uh, overlordship of people's minds, if you like, yeah, exactly. um, um, became a dominant factor and still is. Yep. And that's our problem today. But I think with and I'm, I'm, I'm banging on a bit, but we all of us are worried about the fact that we're heading for 9 billion people on the planet with nowhere near enough water and food to be able to feed them. Um, more and more state control, more and more spending by government. And we know that we're heading for a, a gigantic disaster in terms of total failure of social organizations mm. and administration and debt and bankruptcy chaos yeah and remember plato said that democracies always lead to debt bankruptcy and chaos hmm. and so there again nothing new under the sun to the wise man <laughs> <laughs> that's right um yeah things are indeed um, falling apart on 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 those kinds of levels uh, absolutely and and also i think then that's why it's up to to both wise men and women and people who are thinking to uh, you know 
take their own precautions and, and come to their own solutions and conclusions about what they need to do to, uh, you know, maintain and don't rely for their, if you will, then both food and, and comfort and support and security and what, what have you on those kinds of organizations that are beginning to, to fall apart. I, I reckon that things in that kind of world would just get more and more, uh, you know, insane, if you will, as, as, as we can see that the structure is falling apart and it will do everything it can to sustain itself and protect and, and preserve itself. Uh, but in, in some level, I feel that, like, okay, all you can do is kind of stand, stand away from it a little bit and, and watch as it falls apart, you know, and then maybe at the side of that or, or during that collapse, if you will, uh, a new kind of system organically will, will arise, uh, you know, not maybe out of the ashes of the old one, but before the old one even has had time to collapse, hopefully. I mean, that's a, that's a, a dream in one sense, if you will, but, uh, Hopefully that is something can be achieved so we don't have to go back, if you will, Edmund, to that kind of era and time again where we have mass starvation and, and people, you know, dying because of the the fact that their governmental organization has, has failed, if, if you will. Yeah, the, 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 you know, if we look at um, Chairman Mao and the, the kind of uh, state policies... Uh, which led to starvation in China, um, also and Stalin in Russia. Um, we've been there. We've seen um, what happens uh, when these totalitarian regimes have too much control. But we have very much more sophisticated totalitarian regimes where you find uh, a load of people, as I can put it rather crudely, climbing onto a gravy train. So the people on the gravy train get the pensions, get the wages, get the jobs, get the money. Um, and there's a point in time where there are no more taxpayers left to fund it. Yeah, that's right. So. <laughs> and so we're in a situation when you see countries like South Korea, where government spending is something like 30% of GNP, as we call it. Um, and then you look at places like Northern Ireland, which we've had to maintain something like 75% government spending of GDP, uh, you can see that a lot of those Asian countries which are now in an ascendancy in terms of business civilization, adopting Confucius, following the Chinese model, following the British, British model, mm. Hong Kong and Singapore are following the British model. Um, we've still got um, the potential and even many of our so-called Commonwealth countries, of which I think there are nearly 60, uh, are still uh, um, following our British constitution and rule of law, which is very special, which has been undone completely over the last hundred years in this country. But we're seeing changes, a move to, um, there are good people, there are good countries, there are countries that are worth investing in, there are countries that are going to solve the problems for their people because they're being sensible. So those on our so-called gravy train um, are hitting the buffers. And I think Obama has had this big rejection from the American people because they can see that he's going down the wrong road in terms of the way in which America is being run. Uh, it may be too late to save the dollar, I don't know. And the dollar will have to fall to save America. But um, Britain is in a similar situation and Europe... Um, and uh, it would take a small number of good people to re-establish our British constitution as it was, both in Britain and in America, because the Americans adopted our uh, 1688 89 constitution and rule of law, um, and many of the Commonwealth countries, um, certainly China, uh, led by Hong Kong and Singapore, um, are using a British model. Um, we need to restore law and order in terms of uh, the people of the country being properly represented um, and not being treated as second-class citizens without a voice. Yeah. And, and, and that's hopefully uh, something which can change quite quickly without a war, without fighting, without too much distress. But it's a massive task. That's right. Um, well, Edmund, why don't we... Uh get back here a little bit and, and, and focus a little bit on, on The Shining once again here. Uh, yeah. <laughs> there, there's uh, there's an, a good passage in, in the beginning of the book that uh, obviously, uh, you know, describes obviously what the, what the book is about. 
Uh, and it reads, uh, The Shining Ones, an account of the development of early civilization through the direct assistance of powers incarnated, uh, incarnated on Earth from the material spiritual planes of astral and causal regions. A philosophical discussion based, based on ancient mystical and secular documents from the mytholo- uh, mythologies of all races and on the personal experiences of saints of many persuasions. And, um, you know, if we if we just briefly here talk a little bit about some of the, the sources and some of the material uh, that, that Christian O'Brien, uh, you know, went through or, or, or studied in order to write his books and books and develop his thesis, obviously. Uh, obviously, the, the Bible is just as in Sitchin's work and Lawrence Gardner's work prominently used. And, and there's even the apocryphal texts like uh, the Book of Enoch. There's other kinds of codex like the Askew Codex and the the Book of uh, sorry the Bruce Codex and 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 further, um, you know to 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 emphasize and to to gather data to kind of build his his worldview if you will. But is there any of the sources that you think that are you know were contributing more to Christian uh, O'Brien's uh, work or, or are they all are they all important, uh, Edmund? Do you think? Well. Christian O'Brien, um, the 770 pages in The Shining Ones, you have an extraordinary range um, from a great deal of very basic, very practical archaeological research and information, which follows the trail of the Anunnaki around the world and all the influence. In other words, the culture bearers, um, where they came from, who they were, what they were doing, what they were called in different places. So we have an incredible um, practical um, result. Um, O'Brien went much further um, and um, he did a great deal of research um, and places in the Shining Ones sections which deal with um, this concept which we are now perhaps beginning to understand about other dimensions about communications between other dimensions. There is a whole number of people out there around the world who seem to be plugging into what looks like ancient knowledge, which is not religious. Um, It is um, an understanding that we can all plug into an intelligent and responsive universe. And the requirement here is for people to have reached a certain level Uh, in their meditation, in traveling out of body. Mm. And uh, um, following the quote which you gave, which is a very broad thing, which may frighten a lot of people off and shouldn't, um, is this letter 368 from um, the man that Christian O'Brien sought advice from. And I've always thought or found that if I ask go and find a wise man on any kind of subject skill, go and find a master craftsman. That was one of the quickest and best ways for me to learn things. (laughs) So I followed that. So Christian O'Brien was my master who I went to see and I couldn't believe what he'd done and thought it's crucial he gets his work out. And originally he said, I'm I'm only printing, I'm going to only print three copies of The Shining Ones. Uh, nobody will understand, and uh, I'm very disappointed by the establishment not accepting my earlier work. Hmm. And I said, well, you know, I persuaded him to print 100, and he distributed 50, and I distributed 50. Um, and I'm glad to say on Amazon they were up to 500 pounds each <laughs> on second hand. Um, so we've reprinted. We've got um, a whole picture here. Um, and I, I must mention at this particular point, the path of light which um, all the details are on the website um, and the path of light makes it very clear that what Jesus was actually teaching was what was taught in the ancient mystery schools and the druidic colleges and that was Shurat Shabbat Yoga, soul word union. And we can see that in ancient times um, there was a belief in uh, what is loosely called the spiritual world. The word spirit comes from pneuma, which is Greek, means wind. But we don't have a better word for it. Um, and it seems that in maybe a few hundred years' time, we will have, or maybe less, we may be understanding that there is a line of communication between human beings 
and what they do and what they don't do in the same way there is with plants and animals and the cells of our body. Mm. We're now looking at the cells of our body being incredibly, um, absolutely mind-bogglingly um, well designed. And I say that because many people feel that we're now moving into the world where we're beginning to realize it's not about evolution, it's not about creation, it's about intervention, intelligent intervention. Um, and that's the future, understanding what that's all about and how we can fit in with that. Um, and I just want to put a warning to people here because this is what this letter 368 says. It's not possible to comprehend these mysteries of creation until we have crossed the frontiers of mind and maya, the two lower spiritual regions, regions and one should leave them alone. I'm confident enough in O'Brien himself to know that he is on to something incredibly important and I know from the kind of people who come to me who want to read the Shining Ones and want to read The Path of Light that there's this, you know, it's a really exciting futuristic breakthrough um, and I always say to people who question me on this question of what's going on up there so to speak in the spiritual regions I like the story of Confucius because his own pupils and this is where we go back to 300, 350 BC where Confucian was asked the same thing oh master what's all this spiritual stuff what's going on up there mm. And Confucius said, look, he said, we've got enough problems down here without you worrying about what's going on up there. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, true. Um, that's true. So that's the way I look at it. But yeah. I, what, what the big attraction for many people is not only to have a really good secular history of our planet, which is what O'Brien has provided, but to offer um, something quite different from religion, which is this ability to plug into our intelligent and responsive universe and how... We have, um, I think as Alfred Russell Wallace said, of all the species on the planet, we have the most overdeveloped brain. Uh, we haven't learned how to use many areas of our brain, most areas of our brain. And maybe that's where we're going, hopefully. Mm. Um, we certainly need to. So that's my take on that. Um, and as I say, what O'Brien has done is looked at, I believe, the very best research available to him and going to the top man, uh, the uh, head of the Satsangis, um, who's died now, unfortunately, but there's a, a, they always have another master's appointed. Mm -hmm. And he, um, with all his practical skills as a geologist who had to find oil and had to work out how far the Rocky Mountains have moved and produced some of the best archaeological and research knowledge ever, um, he was prepared to listen to that wise man to begin to understand what was going on in the ancient world and what was being taught in the ancient world. And the crown of his work is the path of light, uh, which much of which um, is being better understood now. Um, but it makes it clear that um, Jesus himself existed. He was an extremely important person. In my opinion, he was um, sent from Britain to try and restore law and order in the land of Palestine because that's where nearly everybody in the world came from, mm -hmm. in the land of Canaan. Uh, and his job was to restore good government and kingship. And, if we had, and, good, and good government was kingship. So if we're looking at the way the city-states worked, the king was the key figure who held everything together. There were no priests or politicians. Very important to realize that. The king might have been called a priest, but his job was to hold the whole thing together. And this is where we dovetail in with Lawrence Gardner's work in terms of the origin of God to see uh, just how crazy um, religion has become and how distorted it's become and how it really was a straightforward story of a small group of survivors starting again an advanced civilization, advanced people, and how they became deified over time. Um, and uh, O'Brien, I think, calls it the pseudo a religious adulation of this original group and how it grew and spawned every kind of fantasy under the sun uh, in the succeeding seven or eight thousand years. Yeah. Well, what uh, I perhaps, perhaps mostly in the latter period because 
Um, so Alan Gardner said that the Egyptians did not have a word for religion. Um, that, that it was a way of doing things, and I believe that was the case up until about the time of Christ. So I think Christ, or Jesus as we call him, um, was a practical man doing a practical job trying to restore kingship in the old world. And both he and Muhammad did not want a new religion. They wanted to get back to the old Abrahamic faith or Abrahamic order. Mm -hmm. And now we know that Abraham was a real person, and we know his relations, and we know he lived in uh, Ur, and his god was Am. So it links the whole chain between Hadrian um, and the Assyrians and Abraham back to Karsag. And we find the links between the Garden of Eden or Karsag and the Druids who played a major role. And Britain being a refuge for the high culture, the high golden age culture, right up to the time of the Roman invasions. Mm -hmm. So it, this is a different take to most people's take. It, it, it is. And, and, and also that, that's what I like about it. It, it, uh, you know, it compiles uh, from a lot of different uh, works and, and sources and it kind of... You know, it's it's it makes sense in one way that things have become become you know became so twisted in one way, if you will, with the with the in terms of uh, the exclusion that has seemed to have happened in terms of certain religious scripture that it's been very selective. There are so many different sources out there, and and when you begin to look through the shining ones, you realize that um, there, there's Gnostic texts, uh, Coptic texts, Akkadian records, Sumerian records. The whole cuneiform thing, and and obviously from that we have uh, the Bible coming coming out. The first the Torah, obviously the the you know attributed to Moses, and then you have the New Testament. And but at this day day and age, we've gone through so many ecumenical you know councils, if you will, and things have been very selective and and refined out. And it's been very few books that have been, have been preserved. But if you read them as a whole. There is a, a logical kind of progression in in the in the knowledge and the advancement and and the, the in the in the way even the the people of the ancient world wrote things, and I think it's when you begin to put them together, look at Sumerian scripts next to Hebrew scripts and things like that, that it becomes really you know more interesting the whole picture as a, as a holistic worldview if you will. It's, it's immensely exciting, immensely exciting, and and I I've, I've actually renamed. I've called these the source books, and to me, the source books for my work and continuing my work is the starting with the genius of the few, which is a fairly straightforward read about the, what the Sumerian records show, how Enoch describes the Garden of Eden quite independently and separately, mm. um, and how the Bible can be uh, retranslated um, and changed to make real sense about not God in heaven, but the bright ones, the geniuses, the shining ones in the planted highlands, or the mm. Elohim. Yeah. And the word shining uh, is a translation of Elohim. Elohim means um, a bright or shining um, person. Um, and we use all these words today, a shining example, etc., and geniuses, and genii, genius. Um, and these were the culture bearers, and all the folk memories talk about them. There shouldn't be any complications at all, because it's in our, within our history, within our blood, within our common sense. Mm. But I've got a very a good quote in front of me from the back of the Path of Light, which is a definition of Gnosticism by somebody called Matter, the Reverend Matter, um, in his Histoire Critique to Gnosticism, 1828. And he says that Gnosticism was the introduction into the bosom of Christianity of all the cosmological and theosophical speculations which had formed the most considerable part of the ancient religions of the Orient and had also been adopted by the Neoplatonists of the West. So yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's a very interesting to, to talk about theosophical speculations because we have seem to have gone overboard, information overload from the time of Christ on uh, what religion means. And yeah. everybody's gone off down different paths rather than getting back to the original journey which we were on and we need to return to, I think. And I, and I believe that the basic Druid doctrine explains that best of all. And the basic Druidic doctrine, which is another quote from the back of the Path of Light, is without freedom of will, there is no humanity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Freedom of conscience is both the birth and breath of manhood. The essence of the soul is will. And even within science, we've begun to realize that even plants... Uh, need free will 
we all perform free will. If we're regimented and contained and boxed, um, we don't perform. We turn into cabbages. God bless the cabbage. I shouldn't be rude about them, but um, a metaphorical term for people who just don't know which way to move when they are um, in their minds are enslaved by the state. Let's put it that way. That's right. Um, we certainly have a lot to to discuss here, uh, uh, Edmund. I want to continue carrying on with you here in our next uh, hour for our members as well. And and I want to ask you later on about your your own trip down to Karsag as well. That's that's interesting to know more about that. But why don't we kind of run things up here for the first hour? Just uh, obviously give out your website again, uh, Golden Age Project. Dot org dot uk and obviously here what we we're, we're getting going to get into in more detail is the uh, the shining ones the the book here uh, by Christian O'Brien that is now back in in print obviously um, the genius of the few is that is out and available as well on the site is is that uh, correct Edmund yes the genius of the few is the, is the book I recommend people to 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 buy and I find that a lot of the people when they've finished the genius of the few they want more and they buy the other books but the genius of the few is a great start. Uh, the Shining Ones is a is a masterwork, um, an encyclopedia, if you like, um, and I think it's, it's useful if people start with the genius of the few. Um, and the Shining Ones packs with both those books pack in so much information. Um, it, 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 it takes uh, different people um, can read. And take different time. The Shining Ones. Lawrence Gardner sat down and read the Shining Ones in one one session, but that was because that was a demonstration of his particular ability. <laughs> <laughs> Some people um, find it difficult to, to read the Shining Ones, and uh, the genius of you and I say, "Well, just take it a chapter at a time." And I've had to read it five or six times because there's so much compressed in there. There's so much. Um, yeah. But I, but I, I just like to think they are. They are the, th- the, 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 the three source books, the, um, the Genius of the Few, the Shining Ones, and the Path of Light. And I would add now very much the origin of God because that fills in so many of the gaps and, and blends in beautifully with the O'Brien work. So Lawrence Gardner and Christian O'Brien together, coming from different directions, um, meet. Uh, and, and Lawrence was always extremely complimentary about, Laura, uh, about Christian O'Brien. And... Um, I think there's a big benefit there. The website, um, there are about 1,100 pages on the website which really show my particular journey in looking at all sorts of things. I've done since then 10 learning from history, um, uh, parts 1 to 10. Um, there are something like 130 uh, images and text on each of those 10 um, learning from histories. So uh, if you start looking at the learning from histories, um, you'll see um, almost doubling the information that the website's got, which is probably an overload situation. Mm. But if you start with uh, learning from history part 10, which is purely a PowerPoint presentation, so this, you don't have to listen to my voice, you can just go through the pages which provide the evidence of the Garden of Eden uh, actually being in the Rishaya Basin um, and at that time of 9,400 is a simple, straightforward route. There will be a, a video lecture out soon um, with, with the, that same, the same lecture but with my voice. But just uh, concentrate on Learning from History Part 10 which is a straightforward PowerPoint and you can look at all the evidence that I've gathered to support the O'Brien thesis and then there's a supporting evidence on the website too under the Garden of Eden section. You'll find Michael Heiser's paper. Mm-hmm. You'll find a, um, a, a number of very important documents which all help to um, actually fit into our, if you like, our jigsaw puzzle so that we can make real sense of what we're talking about. An empire, we call it an empire, but it was a confederation of city-states at about 3,000 uh, 370 um, and this was this great uh, if you like um, increase in population and m- migrations around the world um, and the colonization of the world we find the Sumerians in Peru in North America we find them just about everywhere where you can take a ship and we know that they had and Sitchin highlights these points which you got from Samuel Noah Kramer of 
I think it was something like 60 different names for different aspects of sailing and ships. And then we find ocean-going ships um, in the archaeology of um, southern, the southern area of what is now Iran in the Persian Gulf and bitumen being used to see all the timbers. And it's clear that there were ocean-going ships very much earlier than people accept today yeah, yeah. and that the Sumerians had colonized, literally colonized the world. And even the Cambridge Dictionary talks about the four quarters, which is a word often used by the Sumerians as being the whole world. So I've skated around a lot of issues, but I think it's really important for people to realize that Sitchin and other people claiming that the Sumerians go back 220,000 years just is not making any sense at all. We actually have got to look at all the new excavations, um, Tel Zidon, um, Ketelhoek, uh, the new discoveries in the Jordan Valley, which are giving us city-states which compare with Uruk at the same dates. Mm. And so as we peel back the layer of archaeology and look at the um, tells or occupation mounds um, of the stable city-states where you had maybe three or four thousand years of history on one of those mounds. A good example being Tel Nebi Mend, which is called Kadesh now. And Tel Nebi Mend was the place that Kathleen Kenyon's team wanted to go to next and did go to. And Peter Parr was in charge of the excavations. And they only did a small amount of the work needed, but at least they got down to really serious activity, um, human activity, at about 8,000 BC. Um, and so we've, we've got much earlier dates. The new dating methods are pushing dates back. We're seeing, in fact, we have city-states springing up uh, all over the place in that um, eastern uh, Mediterranean region. Yeah. Um, much earlier than the Sumerian civilization. And I think that's immensely important. And that is where we're going at the moment and where we have to look at the big um, and, uh, and cross-references the most amazing detail about how we have this diffusion of peoples uh, from the land of Canaan. And then we find that the Canaan or Canaan started off as K-H-A and then An on the end. So it might have been something that sounded a bit like Karsag, um, the land of Karsag or the land of An. And mm. then we get the people of Tuafadanan. And then we get Manu in India. So we've got some really interesting things here coming out. But what Waddle did, which I believe is immensely important, is that he was able to look at the, the Indo-Sumerian seals. And these were the very earliest writing, or some of the earliest writing in the Indus Valley and in the Sumerian um, languages, the archaic languages, the Hittites. Um, and he looked at the British Eddas and the Vedas, and he began to realize when he looked at the detailed translations, he was talking about one great Indo-European civilization. Yeah. So we mustn't box the Vedas and the Indus Valley as a different civilization to the Sumerians because it wasn't different. And we mustn't think the Sumerians were the earlier civilization because they weren't. The earlier civilization was clearly three or four thousand years before within the land of Canaan. And Waddle's, um, one of the key points about Waddle where I believe it reveals uh, the importance of dates is the so-called Isin uh, chronology. And Waddle, uh, in, I've got it on my website on the goldenageproject.org.uk. I've got two documents in that chronology which deal with the, the Isin dates, which claim that the Sumerian kings went back to 250,000 BC. <laughs> and this was clearly nonsense. It was one man who got the thing badly wrong. In fact, he was a Cambridge scholar. That may be why people listen to him. I don't know. <laughs> right. But the point was, it was, got, it was very wrong. And what Waddle did brilliantly, and that's also on my website, and I hope it's clear, Waddle realized that if he cross-referenced the data and the language, and he understood what was going on, and anybody who reads the, feet of the Indo-Sumerian seals deciphered by L.A. Waddle will see that Waddle produced an accurate dates for the Sumerian kings. 
and that the first Sumerian king was somebody called Thor or Uraeus mm. at round about 3,370 BC. So the Sumerians were, were if you like, were a, a um, group of kings who formed... Um, uh, I personally still think he managed to open up a whole new area of, of thinking, you know, when it comes to the Anunnaki or the Anunnagi, as uh, Christian calls them, and uh, their level of, of knowledge and sophistication. Um, but, you know, just as Sitchin, Christian O'Brien have, um, you know, had his level of criticism as well, but would, would you compare Christian O'Brien and, and Zachariah Sitchin in any way? What do you think, uh, Edmund, would be the differences and, and the similarities, if any, between them? I think that... Um, um, Zachariah Sitchin uh, brought uh, the attention of, he called them the Aranuki, um, and he is incredibly thorough in terms of the ground he covered on the whole idea that we are the products of an advanced civilization. Uh, he made the point that um, he thought that advanced civilization had somehow come from Nibiru or the sky or spacemen or whatever, or so did von Daniken. Mm -hmm. But what we must do is not get bogged down in the negative. Um, th there are certain things which are now clear, which may not have been clear to Zechariah Sitchin when he started out. I don't believe he had an intent to defraud or to misrepresent the truth. He tried to put the whole story together as a colorful story, and as Michael Heiser said, he was very much based as a journalist primarily, mm. um, as most s successful authors are. I've known some incredible researchers and people who have incredible knowledge who've written books but haven't sold one copy because they didn't do what Zachariah Sitchin did. Right. So how do you get knowledge out there? How do you get across to people? And Zachariah Sitchin was feeding if you like, what people wanted to hear, what they wanted to know um, in terms of this concept of an advanced civilization and that there was much more going on in our human past than anybody realizes. The uh, areas where I think I agree quite a lot of, with what Michael Heiser says, but I think that my own um, strong uh, evidence I obtained from L.A. Waddle, and L.A. Waddle was the man who uh, was the great linguist. Um, he was a lieutenant colonel in the British Army. Mm. He was a great scholar. He was enormously respected by all the key people in the past, Sace, um, uh, Hyatt and Ruth Verrill, um, many other people. I've been reading um, a very interesting document called The Amazing History of Race, and a lot of material there, which is takes the Bible as a history book, it goes and writes to his mother and gives her a fantastic detail of what he's doing and how he's doing it. And those letters reveal extraordinarily disciplined, competent human being and the love he had for his mother. Um, a wonderful basic start in looking at um, somebody who is going to get results, who's going to do the job. And I'm sure Sitchin did that in his own way. And then Lawrence Gardner, as I say, totally different approach to Sitchin. Um, no less important, I think very much more important. Um, but he was telling people what they didn't want to hear. Um, and I found, I actually received a lot of flack for even associating with him, which I found interesting. Uh, I found all the people who were criticizing Lawrence were people who were doing a character assassination without providing one scrap of evidence themselves as to what was wrong with this research. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, my own view was that I believe that he did cover an awful lot of ground, um, as did Sitchin. And I think that a lot of that ground, uh, some of it can be criticized. But if we're going to go anywhere, we've got to look at the things we can agree uh, about. And I've often said to people, look, you really don't like what I say but there are 29 out of 30 things that we can agree on. Let's concentrate on the positive side of this equation yeah. and see what we can develop in terms of further knowledge on the things we agree about and not spend and waste time on things that um, upset either of us either way. <laughs> yeah, yeah.
<laughs> and true. that's really that's really a key point. And so yeah. I, um, in my in my work with Lawrence Gardner, found that he would listen to my point of view. I could argue things with him or discuss things with him, and we had a very constructive relationship. And uh, even with the uh, origin of God, uh, there was some doubt in his mind as to what the Sumerians were actually doing. Mm. And my view was that the genetic modification of uh, crops and, 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 and people definitely took place at the early, the first Karsag, Karsag, the first Eden. And I think that knowledge probably the technology had disappeared by the time we get to Sumer. But I may be wrong, and, and it's an open question. We need more proof, more evidence of that. Yeah. And what we see amongst the Sumerian records, particularly the archaic, very early records, is the remains, very clear remains, of a very advanced civilization. And I'll just mention one key point about Lawrence Gardner. He was criticized for the white powder gold technology, um, yet... I've got the letters that Professor Hapgood, another wonderful man who um, was responsible for maps of the ancient picture. Yeah, yeah. There's new finds uh, coming to the surface all the time in that sense, and uh, you know, again, uh, Sitchin will be you know missed. Obviously, he uh, he had a lot of interesting contributions to make, and and again, I think he opened up this area to a wider audience, as it were, you know, kind of Fondanikin style, obviously as well. In that sense, and obviously interpretations and things can and always should be, you know, argued. Uh, but in many cases, some of these, uh, you know, thinkers are they're spearheading the way a little bit as well for other people to get in there and, and re-examine some of the material that they interpret and, and manage to dig out from these records as well. Um, and I guess when we're kind of on this topic of, of you know, researchers that have been. Uh, passing from this realm, um, I, why don't we just spend a li little bit of time and talk about uh, your friend, I guess, and, and a colleague as well, Lawrence Gardner. He also, you know, passed away here not too long ago, and and he touched upon many of these areas as well. Uh, as well, uh, some of these areas were, were dovetailing in terms of uh, trying to find the the origin for for human civilization and and how far back into history we we can go in terms of archaeology and obviously also looking at uh, religious and, and other kinds of scriptures from the ancient world. Um, and I know that you kind of collaborated a little bit with him on his uh, book that is that is upcoming, one that he wrote called Origin uh, of, of God. Tell us a little bit about that, uh, Edmund. Well, Lawrence Gardner and Zechariah Sitchin are and will be, I think, two of the most famous figures in terms of people who have opened up the door to our ancient human history and the great sophistication of the past and the failings of civilization to pass knowledge from father to son. Sitchin was not a man who produced references. Uh, he was much more of a journal journalist, but he, he demonstrated um, and found all sorts of things which related to an advanced civilization. Um, in my opinion, Lance Gardner's work was as well referenced as any other researcher I've ever known. In other words, his reference were very, very good and valuable. And I spend a lot of time looking at people's references and looking at individuals because you can get a very good idea of whether somebody's telling the truth or anybody's competent if you work with them and see how they work and what kind of people they are. Um, and I'll add just a word on Christian O'Brien, I'm com we're coming to that a little later, but mm -hmm. Christian O'Brien, we've got a, um, a wonderful uh, book of his letters to his mother called Eastern Odyssey. And as a young man from Cambridge and the first years of his working life, he